Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the first webinar that's hosted by our center, the Center for Behavioral and Implementation Science Interventions at the National University of Singapore at Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine. I am Nick Sevdalis, and I'm the host for today's webinar. I'm a professor at the NUS School of Medicine, and I am the academic director of the Busy Centre. I'm delighted to be hosting and moderating our first webinar for this year. This is our first webinar for 2024. Uh, I'm very, very pleased to have two excellent colleagues with me from different backgrounds to talk about what I think is really a cutting edge topic, both for Singapore and globally, but also some really interesting methodologies as to how do we go about studying the topic. And and you'll see in the next few minutes why this is, I think, critically important. Our main speaker for today is Eden Meng Zhu, who's joining us from Singapore, I'm very pleased to say right now, although she is normally based at uh, the Erasmus University in Rotterdam in the Netherlands, in Europe, uh, where she is completing a PhD within the Erasmus School of Health Policy and Management. So, Eden, welcome to Singapore. I'm delighted to be hosting you at Busy and really, really keen to hear what you'll be presenting over the next hour or so. Uh, and I'm also delighted to be joined here by another excellent colleague based at uh, NUS School of Medicine, a clinical associate professor, Reshma Merchant, who is essentially uh, one of our leading academic geriatricians uh, at NUS and with whom we're collaborating on, on several projects in the context of population health uh, in, in Singapore and, uh, and, uh, and beyond. Reshma, uh, welcome and thank you for joining us. Reshma will be the discussants that will follow on with some thoughts and reflections and questions and challenges following the presentation by Eden. So essentially, uh, the way we'll run this webinar is slightly different for those of you who might have attended some of our events uh, in the past. Um, I will uh, very quickly pass the floor to Eden, who will uh, talk to us about a study that she has completed, uh, which I've had the pleasure of collaborating in, uh, and the study is about implementation of community-based interventions for informal carers for people with with dementia. So Eden will present the method, the findings, and the implications of the study, and then I will invite Reshma to, as I said, share some of her reflections. I think this is really topical. We know that Singapore, as well as several advanced health economies in, in the world, is aging very rapidly. Uh, dementia might be a case study, but the fact that we have informal caring going on, um, and that would apply to, to several conditions uh, and uh, would also be applicable to ever-increasing chunks of our population, I think this is something we need to take into account. So we'll find out about what interventions uh, are well evidenced, but more importantly, what is the evidence for how to implement them at scale and sustainably? This is really the focus of today, which brings me to the second important aspect of the seminar, in our opinion, at Busy. It's not enough, as we um, uh, keep saying at all webinars, to know what effective interventions are, effective programs for population 
health or effective clinical interventions are. The key is that we need to be delivering them at scale consistently to those who need them. And this is where implementation behavioral sciences come in. So the focus of today is to see what innovations a implementation behavioral sciences have to offer so that whatever interventions we might deem, for example, applicable to the Singaporean context, how we might go about implementing them, might we require some adjustments, adaptations, how do we go about doing those and, and evaluating what works in our local or national context. So this will be the focus of today, which I think uh, both from a clinical public health, but also methodological point of view, that, that we're, we're hitting multiple points of innovation. And I would very much hope that uh, we'll generate some discussion. Once Rashma has concluded with some initial thoughts, I would invite all of you to use the Q&A function. Please do not use the chat function because we cannot really follow it. Use the Q&A function. You'll find that around the middle of your screen towards the left at the bottom of your Zoom, please, as uh, Eden or Rashma go through their points, uh, put some questions or comments. I will be keeping an eye as a moderator, and I will come to those uh, in the last sort of um, uh, 15 minutes or so of our webinar. So this is how we're going to run it, and we'll run to time. We'll conclude the webinar at the top of the hour. So you can all go back to uh, your meetings, your work, or whatever else you're doing. Um, thank you uh, again to um, Eden Rashma for joining us today. Without further ado, Eden, the floor is yours to take us through what you did and what you found. Thank you so much, Professor Nick, for the warm introduction. And thank you to the attendees for joining us from all over the world. It's an honor to share the research that we've conducted with a, such a wide audience. Um, today, we'll be talking about how implementation science and implementation literature surrounding community-based interventions for informal caregivers of people with dementia. The webinar is based off of the results from a scoping review recently published last October in the Implementation Science Journal. The protocol can be found in BMJ Open. And if you're interested after this webinar, both articles are open access, so please feel free to look into them. So we are the first to use three unique frameworks from implementation science together in one review. And in this webinar, I will elaborate on how we obtained our results and I'll share our key findings to shine light on current implementation practices and challenges unique to these community-based evidence-based interventions. So before I begin, I'd like to briefly introduce my team. So as Nick mentioned, my name is Eden and I'm a PhD candidate and I specialize in dementia care research. And during my PhD, I received expert guidance from Professor Robert Hausman, who's a leading expert in dementia research in the Netherlands, uh, and Professor Case Outhouse, who has decades of research experience in value-based healthcare. My co-author, Dr. Martina Bullets, and her experience in organizational behavior was vital in developing the research direction. Also, in the early stages of my PhD, I was introduced to Professor Nick, whose expertise in implementation science was essential in guiding us through the complex literature and the application of these frameworks. So given the novelty of applying implementation to dementia care, it was the perfect combination of specializations to conduct this interdisciplinary research. I wanna emphasize that having a well-rounded multidisciplinary team is fundamental to producing a strong implementation-focused research project. So dementia is a general term for several neurode uh, neurodegenerative conditions that affect cognitive function, which may alter the mood, memory, and personality traits and limit independent living. According to Alzheimer's Disease International, by 2030, there will be an estimated 78 million people with dementia, and the annual cost of dementia globally is expected to meet uh, uh, 2.8 trillion US dollars. The current research investments are made toward improving diagnostic capacity, which includes enhancing diagnostic accuracy and accessibility. Treatments, including discovering new drugs to manage dementia symptoms and slow down neurological degeneration, is also very important. Uh, investments are also made towards prevention, which include, includes increasing public health awareness campaigns that target these modifiable risk factors earlier in life. And last but not least, care, which includes developing a range of interventions that support people living with dementia and their caregivers so they may continue to live in to complete their day-to-day -day activities. Today in this webinar, we'll be talking about the implementation of care research. So in order to successfully and sustainably provide dementia care, 
the impact and role of informal caregivers should be acknowledged and appreciated. Informal caregivers are typically friends and family members and spouses of people living with dementia. In Singapore, foreign domestic workers are often tasked with this role as well. According to the World Health Organization, globally, caregivers collectively provide 89 billion hours of informal care, and 70% of informal care is provided by women. This makes the issue of dementia care and informal care a health issue, a labor issue, and a gender issue. We should also recognize that informal care helps reduce hospital admissions and thus reducing the healthcare expenditure and the strain on local health systems. Also, informal care improves quality of life for people living with dementia. For those of you joining us from Singapore, and if you're interested in learning more about this topic, here are some local resources and so support. So previous studies found that there are over 500 interventions for informal caregivers for, for people with dementia, but we found eight common categories in our review. I will be focusing on the four most common in this webinar. So the first being psychoeducation, which includes education for caregivers regarding the physiological state of dementia, uh, including care planning, uh, as well as behavioral management and their own self-care. Support groups are also a very prominent intervention type. This includes uh, support programs that enhance social connections. E-health or electronic health interventions are also very prominent. And these include mobile applications that help the informal caregiver. And lastly, the care coordination and case management interventions. These include interventions that provide caregivers with care consultants, and they help with case management, care planning, referral to resources, and ensure continuity of care for people with dementia. So we know that there are over 500 interventions, but how are they implemented into practice? How have researchers conducted and reported on this implementation process? So in this review, we had three main objectives. First, we wanted to know what were the main implementation barriers and facilitators that influenced implementation success. Next, we wanted to identify what were the strategies used in this implementation process. And lastly, we wanted to explore the implementation outcomes reported in these studies and how they were reported and what indicators were used. So in order to approach these objectives, we needed guidance from implementation science theoretical frameworks. So in implementation science, there are three main types of frameworks. If you're looking to describe or guide your research in the process of knowledge creation, knowledge translation, knowledge transfer, and implementation, you'd likely use a process model. If you were looking to understand or explain what variables influence the implementation outcomes, you could use a determinant framework. And lastly, if you were to evaluate or understand why an implementation strategy worked or didn't work, you could use an evaluation framework. In our review, we found that 21 of 67 studies included used an implementation science framework and reported it explicitly. This may suggest a gap in the application of implementation science knowledge in the dementia care research. So in order to target our first objective of identifying variables that influence implementation, we use the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research, or the CIFR. We use it to guide our data extraction. CIFR consists of five main domains. Uh, first, looking at the intervention characteristics, which includes the intervention's original source, the initiator, and the strength of evidence surrounding this intervention. Next, we looked at the outer setting domain, which includes the implementation environment and the infrastructure in which the intervention is implemented. So looking at the local policies and the health financing structures. Next, we looked at the inner setting of the implementing organization, including its structural characteristics, such as the culture and the climate. And the, the characteristics of the individuals within the implementing team is also very influential, which include the team's personal beliefs about the intervention. And lastly, the process of inter implementation was also very uh, influential at, to the implementation outcome, which includes planning and execution of the implementation plan. 
so as you can see on the right side of the screen, there is a QR code that will link you to the most updated version of the CIFR framework. And that has been recently released in 2023. In our results, we found that e-health interventions or experience barriers to implementation. Primarily, the implemented teams found that there were technical issues with the intervention components, and they faced difficulties with the complex user interface. Also, the interventions often didn't fit in existing dementia and aged care services, and there was a lack of integration within existing infrastructure. Next, for support groups, the implementation was impeded by the financing challenges due to ineffective reimbursement schemes or unsuitable reimbursement schemes. And there were limited referral pathways and post-diagnostic support due to weak network relationships between the general practitioners and community level care providers. Next, with psychoeducation interventions, they experienced challenges with sustainment after the pragmatic RCTs were concluded. And there was a lack of outreach to community care providers from initiators which lacked awareness, who lacked awareness of these services. The care coordination and case management interventions experienced implementation challenges if local hospital systems did not provide continuity of care or if caregivers were left to contact community support agencies independently without direct support from general practitioners. There were also quite a few facilitating factors that we found in this review. So for example, for eHealth, the use of social media marketing strategies to disseminate also helped raise awareness. And use of site analytics, including website traffic and visitor retention to monitor user behavior, also helped measure implementation success. Also, when the intervention initiator was directly involved in training for the implementing agency, Trust was established and organizations were more committed to delivering these interventions. For support group interventions, it was helpful if local community centers and faith-based institutions were involved. So for example, churches, temples, and mosques, if they were involved and they were promoting the intervention, they, were, they would help um, sustain and promote the implementation and delivery of these interventions. Also, obtaining multiple streams of financing through government incentive schemes was helpful to sustain this intervention. So it's sometimes good to be adaptive and have creative thinking when applying for these grants and funding. So following psychoeducation interventions were also successful if the implementation teams were involved uh, or involving the intermediary organizations, such as local nonprofits, uh, in order to engage their existing resources and their networks for dissemination. If the implementation implementing agency already had a staff team working in a similar function or role, and if similar interventions already existed within their workflow, it would be easier to accept this intervention into their billing structure and workflow. Uh, lastly, for care coordination and case management interventions, they would be successful if training was formally conducted using a protocolized plan and if regional and local governments supported continuity of care in their agendas. Our second objective in this review was to understand how interventions were implemented and to find out we use the expert recommendations in implementing change taxonomy or the ERIC taxonomy. This is a, a taxonomy of 73 discrete strategies that can be grouped into nine relational clusters. These clusters describe the activities employed. So first, the use of evaluative and iterative strategies, such as assessing readiness and identifying barriers and facilitators. Next, using interactive assistance, such as providing technical assistance and facilitating throughout the process. Um, adapting and tailoring the intervention and implementation to context, such as tailoring strategies to address local barriers. Uh, developing stakeholder interrelationships by identifying leaders and building partnerships in the area. Next, training and educating stakeholders uh, by conducting ongoing training and consultations. These are also strategies that are used to facilitate the implementation process. Next, supporting clinicians uh, by revising professional roles. This may include increasing the um, the breadth and the coverage of their roles. Next, engaging consumers 
by including end users as active participants in the development process. Uh, following their financial, utilizing financial strategies by accessing new funding to sustain the intervention. These are also very valid implementation strategies. And lastly, changing the infrastructure uh, through which the, in which the implementation is uh, facilitated by changing possibly record systems and physical infrastructures within the implementing agencies. So this is a brief summary of the taxonomy but the details of the 73 specific uh, discrete strategies can be found in the original article. This is provided in the QR code on the right side of the screen. So we want to know what are the most common strategies found in the implementation process for each type of intervention. So e-health interventions were most commonly uh, facilitated through tailored implementation strategies that promoted adaptability and flexibility by providing multiple possible modalities. For example, the iSupport and InLife app, uh, applications. These are two eHealth educational platforms that were included in the review. iSupport was created and disseminated by the World Health Organization team. And InLife was developed in the Netherlands by dementia researchers. And they were disseminated through a third party training organization. They both focused on distributing educational content and making knowledge and training as accessible as possible. So next for support interventions, um, such as the widespread meeting center support program that has now been scaled up across community centers in Europe, such as in the Netherlands, the United Kingdom, Italy, and Poland. The most common strategies used to implement these support interventions were found within cluster four, which is developed stakeholder interrelationships. The implementation of support interventions commonly relied on seeking local champions and building formalized arrangements and networks. Next, we're looking at the psychoeducation interventions. An example of that is the Savvy Caregiver Program based in the United States. This was a Department of Veteran Affairs supported project. And in the study, there were staff members that were part of the research team However, they were not clinical staff, so the sustainment affected, uh, the same was an issue once it was, uh, once the research was finalized. The implementation strategies were found in, within cluster five, which is train and educate stakeholders. So for example, another example in the Medway CARES course, it was developed by a specialist psychologist responding, for, responding to clinical need. And this is created based on demand from real world practice, and that enhances sustainability. Whereas the previously mentioned Savvy Caregiver Project was based on research, and sustainment was a bit difficult. Right. And also, training was facilitated by a treatment manual, and they used role playing exercises to um, facilitate this training process, which made training dynamic. So for care coordination and case management, an example that we found in the review was the Cleveland Alzheimer's demonstrated care, uh, sorry, Cleveland Alzheimer's de managed care demonstration. And this was a care consultation delivered by staff from the Alzheimer's Association. And the Alzheimer's Association is an intermediary organization and patient representative group with an extensive network of patients, caregivers, research, researchers, industry members, and policymakers. Strategies for care coordination and case management were found mainly in the developed uh, stakeholder interrelationship cluster, specifically promoting network weaving and developing academic partnerships. So for example, establishing formal partnerships between the Veteran Affairs Medical Center and the Alzheimer's Association chapters strengthened the evidence dissemination and reach. Strategies were also found in cluster six, which is to support clinicians and this included for revising professional roles and developing resource sharing agreements. For example, care consultants were del delivered through the Alzheimer's Association and the staff members from the Alzheimer's Association who were trained at a master's level. They are social workers and they were trained to adopt this new intervention and it would simplify embedding new practices into existing workflows. And Lastly, we looked at the uh, implementation outcomes and how they were reported within the included studies. 
So we found that acceptability was often reported as the intervention suitability or usability and helpfulness for the users and for the implementing team. Uh, also, the appropriateness of the end users, um, how they were, how the appropriateness was perceived by the end users and the implementing agency. This was often reported as the satisfaction with the intervention and the intervention of, of components, as well as the implementation strategies selected. Penetration was used to evaluate the organization or the local implementation setting. And strategies mainly applied to this setting described how users were recruited, including the marketing strategies. So acceptability, appropriateness, and penetration were the most common outcomes reported. However, there were studies that also reported and described the sustainability of an intervention. And this was described as the organization's demand for program continuation and the routinization of care. Studies mainly focus on describing the existing internal and external financing mechanisms and the role of collaborators and external agencies in training and scaling up the intervention. Implementation fidelity was also described in this review, and it was described as the implementing team's degree of adherence to the original implementation protocol. This, uh, the implementation fidelity enhancing strategies included protocolizing implementation uh, using training certification programs initiated by the original creators and using fidelity checklists and guiding scripts to make sure that the implementation was as conducted as it was planned to be. Next, the adoption of these interventions was reported as how administrations are motivated to buy into the intervention and how engagement of local influencers may promote user uptake. The feasibility was also described in this review as the degree to which intervention components fit within an organization and how components are pragmatically streamlined into existing workflow. Implementation cost is also a uh, implementation outcome and that was reported as how the operational and staffing costs were covered. And this was, this was mainly through government regulated financing programs. So the varied representation and reporting styles of implementation outcomes are important to recognize since researchers do not always use, use homogenous language in the literature. And it's also important for future research to evaluate these implementation outcomes using clear research designs and measurement tools. So as a reminder of the objectives of this review, we looked at the implementation context. We looked at the barriers and facilitators that determine the implementation success. And in order to do that, we used the consolidated framework for implementation research. And next, we looked at the implementation strategies used uh, in this implementation process. And we used the Eric taxonomy to guide us in extracting that data. And lastly, we looked at the implementation outcomes and indicators reported in these included studies, and we were guided by the implementation outcomes framework. So all of the original articles can be found through the QR codes on this slide. Right, so the main takeaways and the future direction of implementation research in dementia care. So for researchers, I would suggest that performing a scoping system, so a scoping review or a systematic review would require multiple lenses as performed in this study in order to understand implementation comprehensively. We want to understand how research uh, researchers are conducted um, in various settings and which stakeholders are, are involved and when are they involved. We want to know how to work across systems and foster implementation collaboratives that support scale up and sustainability. We also want to find out how, to, how do contextual barriers impact strategies across different settings. So for example, in low and middle income countries, do they differ from in other countries, maybe in the global north? Also, and how can these implementation strategies change if you were to apply them in areas with underrepresented population groups or minority groups or marginalized groups. So these are all areas that we should explore in future research. Following, we should also expand how knowledge of implementation science can be used in, envi in community environments outside of hospitals where they were typically developed. Um, this would ha happen by elaborating on community level strategies, which may be different from clinical uh, implementation strategies. 
Also, future studies can look at the how to conduct evaluative studies to understand why strategies work or why they fail to work in different conditions. That concludes my uh, section of this webinar. And thank you so much for your attention. Uh, please feel free to connect with me through email or through LinkedIn if you're curious about the research or have any additional thoughts or questions after this webinar. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, Eden, thank you uh, very much. Uh, you presented very uh, uh, concisely what I think is is a monster of a review uh, for those of our colleagues who have managed to look at uh, the paper. Um, so, uh, but before, and I just remind everybody, please do use the Q&A uh, function, as we've just reminded you uh, in the chat, I'm, I'm uh, just about seeing now some questions coming in. But before we get to those, uh, Reshma, uh, now is your turn to uh, share any views, reflections, what this means from a point of view of um, uh, clinical services, which of course uh, you very well um, uh, lead on and design and manage, but also how do we learn from reviews such as this one as to what might be appropriate and feasible and sustainable and so on in a Singaporean context and, and, and so on. So how do we make use of uh, very laboriously carried out reviews uh, like uh, the one that Eden just summarized uh, uh, for us? And any other thoughts uh, before we uh, get on to uh, comments and queries by our audience? Freshman. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, I mean, that was really a great presentation. And I think it's a good reminder that we know most interventions do work in the caregivers of persons with dementia. And the implementation strategy is just so important, right? Um, so the one thing we have to remember is the trajectory of persons with dementia. It's not linear. It's, it's unpredictable with multiple stages and at different stages, they will actually have different needs. Um, in early dementia, it's, you know, different needs in moderate and in advanced dementia. And knowing uh, what works in different stages is actually very important. And obviously in Singapore, I mean, we have to take into account with regards to their cultural differences um in terms of um we we know the prevalence of anxiety depression fatigue is significantly higher in caregivers of persons with dementia than it is with other caregivers and it's very important to understand their readiness to accept help as such so uh, speaking of which we're very fortunate in singapore we actually have multiple agencies uh, from acute hospital to community to the active aging centers. We've got CRES, we've got a um, lot of associations in Singapore who, who do provide support for persons with dementia and their caregivers as well. Um, you could say, yes, they do provide psychoeducation. Um, they do provide uh, caregiver support. Um, and the question then is, um, how do you communicate seamlessly in terms of data sharing? I'm sure we could do in terms of coordination. For example, if the person is admitted to the hospital and the significant caregiver stress, how do I then transmit the information directly to the community providers? I'm sure we could we could do much better in that. Uh, but on the whole, as I said, there's, there's a lot of opportunities out there how we can manage things better. Um, going back to the implementation strategies, obviously we've, we've got this thing about acceptability um, and user satisfaction. And um, it'll be very interesting to even measure whatever facilities we have out there. Um, you know, how satisfied are end users? Do they think? the platform they have in terms of psychoeducation is sufficient? Um, is there um, kind of one stop where we can get all the information to empower them in terms of, you know, how to manage with different behaviors, with day-to-day -day changes, with loss of appetite, or say if I want to access any uh, facilities like step-down care, I mean, is there like a one-stop center or a phone call? Uh, you know, I could just dial in a number and ask them, you know, uh, where do I get help from? 
Um, and obviously, in terms of different strategies, it's very important that it's applied, uh, which is relevant to their particular stage, like occupational therapists. Obviously, if somebody has just been diagnosed with dementia and they're still very independent and they're still traveling, I mean, the last thing you want is to uh, to, to 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 try to introduce occupational therapists because they may feel really intimidated. It's like, why do I need this now? You know, I don't really need that. So knowing what stage to apply the intervention, it's actually just equally important. Um, digital literacy, again, again, uh, we know post-COVID, a lot more people do have digital literacy. But again, that's something um, we, we need to know how ready are they to adopt digital platforms. And again, language is another barrier because some of them may, may not be able to communicate in English or, or read in English um, and things like that. Um, again, in terms of... Um, how does any of the interventions fit into our current workflow? Um, where do we fit it in? How do we fit it in? We do we do need a macro view of that about um, how do we fit into the pieces in different stages. And um, in terms of, um, um, you know, if we're going to partner with our community providers, you know, do we actually have a protocol? Do we have a training module that we can um, try to accredit them on a regular basis? Um, do we specifically focus uh, our psychoeducation and training on different stages of dementia? I think these are some of the things we will need to look into to really implement um, some of the interventions successfully in the local setting. Oh, absolutely. And I think we're having several questions coming through uh, uh, the uh, Q&A. So uh, I think I'm, I'm keeping from what um, some sort of key topics uh, amongst the other things that you mentioned, Reshma, the fact that we need to understand the context and the workflows both for the actual interventions, but also in terms of of um, uh, the implementation process. And indeed, you mentioned about need for um, awareness raising and or training, because uh, not all the interventions are created equal. So we can't just throw something in and expect that people will will, will pick it up and 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 run. So there's an issue here to think about how do we adapt. Uh, within the context that we're talking about. And and there's interestingly enough, several people have picked up on the Q&A. So I would suggest Eden and, and Reshma, if you get a, a, a chance to check out the Q&A. There's, there's, in relation to these points, there is a, a, a question that's come up a couple of times about Eden, how much can we say from the evidence that you've managed to synthesize that whether there are differences between Western versus Asian uh, sort of countries, is that something that there was enough evidence for you to be able to make some sort of generalizable um, uh, comments at all? Right. I think that's a very valid question to ask. Um, so in the review, the majority of the studies were found in the U.S., in the United Kingdom, in the Netherlands. So as you can see, there's a very Western-oriented studies and I think the literature surrounding implementation, it's slowly including Asian countries. However, it hasn't quite gotten there yet. But I found that there were a few interventions that were adapted for uh, Asian populations in the United States. And the implementation strategies required to implement these interventions um, required more thought toward tailoring and uh, adapting strategies. So keeping these interventions flexible and ad adapting the interventions through language, through culture, these are all very uh, important considerations to make while considering implementation. However, um, for example, interventions created in Taiwan or in China or in Singapore, I think those are still in early stages. I did come across an individual in a research team working on dementia, um, dementia e-health interventions uh, at NUS actually, and they're currently developing a mobile application. Um, I think that's a great opportunity to start working with teams that are in early stages and help helping them consider implementation planning early on. So thank you for this. And a related question that's also appeared in the chat is, can we comment on the um, strategies uh, or barriers, drivers, and, and related strategies for 
different socioeconomic groups or, or groups at different levels of, of education and so on. Uh, I, I think what's coming across is to what level can we be a bit more, if you like, granular and specific in relation to these strategies? So could you comment on on um, the applicability or generalizability, if you like, of, of uh, uh, these strategies for particular groups of the population? Right. So, yeah, I think the generalizability of implementation strategies, they say well, context eat strategies for breakfast in the implementation space. Uh, so you really can't say that this strategy will work indefinitely or this will definitely work in every context. I think the barriers are definitely unique. And uh, of course, you can structure your research to uh, explore the barriers and then make minor tweaks based on what you find. But it's it's I would not recommend to say that this strategy will definitely work in this context. There's no way I could confidently say that. Um, and of course, for different uh, cultural groups, you need to look at what they can accept and what they can't accept. And this definitely requires the first step of going into these communities and understanding um, what are the cultural norms, what is and isn't acceptable. Uh, so, for example, in Asian culture, cultures, we have the concept of filial piety, which does not really exist in Western countries. Uh, but Western researchers may not keep that at the forefront of their considerations when designing interventions, such as um, interventions based in nursing homes. Since placing a parent or a person with dementia in a nursing home is typically culturally frowned upon. So these are some of the considerations to make. And the implementation also does, it definitely relies and depends on the cultural context. Uh, thank you for that. So I'll, I'd like to come to Rashma for a sort of view from, uh, you know, the world of, of services and sort of service development, essentially. How do we take into account this level of cultural, linguistic, educational, socioeconomic, and, you know, you can put as many variables as you like, uh, differences and context in designing services. And we already have one of the major, and you've mentioned it yourself, Rashma, one of the major sort of parameters is hospital-driven versus community-driven. Uh, so can you comment on how we might do that um, based on, you know, evidence and theory and all these frameworks that we have to facilitate us doing it. How might we do this on the ground or perhaps examples of how you do it in the context of the services that, that you're involved in? Thanks, Nick. Yeah, I think what you're describing is the impact of social determinants of health, of trying to um, um, implement a lot of these strategies, right? We, we know um, a lot of it, does impact on caregiver readiness, the knowledge about what is dementia, um, their financial status, what um, the trust in the person who's delivering it is also very, very important. I mean, obviously, um, some may have more trust in certain healthcare professionals trying to deliver the same interventions. So again, it's all about understanding who are these caregivers, what exactly their needs are in different stages, what are the constraints, right? I mean, um, a lot of facilities in Singapore, um, there's, a, there's a fee applied to it, be it occupational therapists, be it um, daycare centers, be it dementia Montessori, a lot, and, and a lot of people may have financial constraints even to take up some of these interventions. And we're talking real world. I mean, fair enough. I mean, a lot of studies that were mentioned were in a research setting. You know, things are very different when they're in research setting versus in real world. Um, so, again, knowing what are the barriers of uh, taking it up. And obviously, I think um, one of um, the Q&As, do we even have outcomes? Yes, we do have CREST. We got COMET. Yes, I mean, we do our, well, we think we do our work in the hospital setting about advising them about what is dementia, how do they manage their behavior. But then again, I tell them, look, I'm only seeing you 15 minutes of your time and the rest of whatever, six months, I mean, it's going to be you managing your loved ones at home. And where do they then go and seek help when they need during the rest of their time where they're not seeing me in the clinic, for example, 
right? Um, so again, knowing having a dashboard, you know, going where, uh, for example, yes, my mom has advanced dementia. She uh, she's not eating her food. She's spitting out her food. Where where do I go for help? Who do I ask? Right? Who can provide me with that? Um, support or education support or care coordination for me to then manage that situation. And obviously, I think a lot of these implementations that we've just discussed today, um, while they may not have measured outcome, but one of the outcomes for many of them is, you know, how can I prevent um, the loved ones or persons with dementia coming to the emergency department for something simple that we could have just empowered the caregiver to manage them at home, right? So whatever we think um, in terms of adoptability, sustainability, um, you know, um, and I think we need to think about the long-term impact in terms of persons with dementia, caregivers, and also of the whole health ecosystem as well. Uh, thank you. So, so which uh, there's one of the questions that I think relates to what you're describing uh, there, Reshma, which is a very Singaporean sort of contextual sort of element or factor, which is the foreign domestic workers. And and as one of our um, um, uh, audience members quite rightly points out, it is a question: How do we engage with them? Because we know that they're there, and we know. Uh, that they uh, undertake, or they might yeah, undertake even more, uh, caring responsibilities at home. So is there a potential avenue for the Singaporean context to tap into some of the interventions, uh, for example, psychoeducation or other types um, um, of interventions that Eden covered in terms of implementing um, informal care support for that particular uh, cohort? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a very, very valid and important question because the trajectories change, right? When the domestic helper were employed, probably the older person was relatively independent and then they declined. Um, one of the avenues of dementia Singapore, we can always call them up for, for advice. I mean, they do have occupational therapists. They do have, um, you know, they do provide caregiver training and they do have a list of resources that many of us can tap on. Um, I mean, similarly with with the the newer concept with the aging centers, the active aging centers that are now coming in our neighborhood area, um, they could be another form of resource uh, for us to seek help. And failing of which, the agency of integrated care. I mean, um, they do have a contact point and, and a phone number that we could actually dial in and, and seek for help as well. But as I said, we we do have these services. We can definitely do better, but. Um, uh, it's important to hear, but, you know, while we do have the services, how many people even go forward and get help in the first place, right? Um, so it's all about knowledge, about acceptability, um, you know, uh, how ready, how comfortable are they in seeking help? How comfortable are they in knowing that whatever information I'm sharing with you is actually confidential for you to help me, right? Um, so yeah, it's really it's it's and, I, and it's also very important to actually share the outcomes of of um, our community partners who are doing it. You know, um, for people to to share how they benefited for, from some of it. Um, we do have support groups, and in fact, uh, there, there are a lot of support groups um, across the island in in different hospitals in different centers. Um, again, there are some limitations of support group. I've heard from caregivers and said, look, you know, we can't make it to the support group because we are caregivers ourselves. We cannot leave the person with dementia at home. So where then and how then do we have concurrent activities for the caregivers and the persons with dementia in the same center so that we could provide some respite care for the caregivers for persons with dementia? Um, again, support group issues, again, is language, um, you know, and because they're varied people who are caring from that, like for them, it, it ranges from spouses to domestic helper to children, trying to find the right time for the support group, the right language to conduct the support group is also very important. The right people to lead the, the interventions, because some of the feedback we get from caregivers is, what do you understand? You know, you're still very young, you know, you don't really understand what is it like to care for a person with dementia. So again, when we are planning some of uh, the interventions, we actually have to put ourselves in the shoes of, pers of the caregivers of persons with dementia about what is it like to be a caregiver? Like not being able to even go and have your hair do, you know? 
um, or, yes. or even just get a breather or go to the toilet, for example. I mean, you know, it's things like that they sometimes need help with, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And it's and I, and I think, well, Reshma, you hit the nail on the head, and I think this is why we we felt that busy that this is a really this is a really topical presentation because it seems that through the experience of doing all these uh, or undertaking all these initiatives, uh, if you like, Singapore, um, uh, we all know is very good at, at launching various initiatives, but we can now essentially take a step back. I think the literature is ripe to inform what we do. Essentially, we're looking at the barriers at the face. So we know uh, but, but the, the, these are things that, that carers um, um, are facing. They're telling us the question then becomes of the library of interventions that that we have that Eden very nicely summarized, how much of the, how many of these are applicable and in what format? So where do we adapt them to to, to get, um, uh, if you like, the most support to the, the, the people who need it the most, make them aware and able, not just aware, but able to, to sort of use uh, these interventions. I would. There's another thread in the in the Q and A which I now would like us to 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 take us, and that's about what makes a good implementation. Essentially, if I were to to sort of summarize the question, several people are asking, why are we having so many different implementation outcomes, which, however, sound rather similar, like the perceived acceptability or the perceived appropriateness of an intervention? And there's a related question that that could we sort of reduce that list? And also, what is a good implementation outcome? What is good acceptability? What is good feasibility? So, Eden, could you uh, take a stab at this from from your point of view? What did you see in the studies? Were there explicit criteria uh, set for what good looks like? And were they sort of similar across studies? Uh, I can then offer a comment as to why we need so many outcome measures. Uh, but but let's uh, uh, see what the, uh, uh, the evidence um, or the studies uh, had to suggest first. Right. That is a very interesting question. Uh, so the, maybe it's good to clarify that the, that the scope of this review, we looked at studies that looked at implementation. But one weakness that we did have was that we didn't, we only we included it if it mentioned the implementation process, but the study design was not as strict. So for studies that were that would be specifically looking at the implementation outcome and, and evaluating the outcome, their indicators are much more clear. And the definition of what a good implementation outcome is would be much more clear. But in the review, we didn't really come across any studies that were that structured and uh, had that strong of a research design. So a lot of the reportings of what good acceptability is, is if the, for example, if the providers were uh, happy with this, were happy in their experience with delivering this uh, intervention. It also looked at whether the user was uh, using it correctly or, you know, so more um, subjective or normative um, responses from the uh, participants. Um, Yeah, it's it's a very interesting question. I think there's a lot of um, considerations to make um, and the indicators for acceptability there. They have been defined in the implementation outcome framework, but in, in reality, in the studies included, it hasn't been that explicit. And, and therefore, is it fair to say, Eden, that one of one of the findings, if you like, the more methodology-related findings, is that of of the sixty odd, sixty-seven studies that you found, the the studies were using different measures of those outcomes in a way that you wouldn't necessarily find as much variation in the clinical literature. Mm-hmm. Uh, I is is was that the case yes so the for example there there didn't have specific indicators a lot of the time and a lot the majority of the studies were indeed qualitative so they would report things such as they found this, this implementation strategy helpful or so the it was difficult to standardize across the studies so we were only able to group it based on what was reported and if it seemed like the text stated that this intervention was acceptable or this, um, the way that this intervention was brought into the organization was acceptable, then we would match that to right. how you know Proctor uh, had described it in the original framework. So it's very difficult. And that's, to- and that's a good point. Uh, and I think just to bring back to the wider literature, I think it was a very, very valid point raised by uh, our, our audience about why, why this variation. The reality is that 
uh, this the, the concept of an outcome of an implementation process is a relatively recent thing in the literature. It was developed to mirror the sort of clinical outcome of a clinical process and to also help design studies like the ones that Eden uh, summarized. But because the literature is fairly young, we're talking about decades or a decade and a half worth of, of such studies. Um, and because we haven't had enough time to develop and um, use enough of those metrics in enough studies, so that we can then summarize them and use fewer metrics and we know which ones have better validity and therefore um, 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 uh, create an evidence base that's a bit more coherent. I think we need another several years worth of studies and it's important that studies use validated outcome measures because otherwise we're going to be here five years later having a very similar conversation with an updated version of this review where we're going to still um, have the critique of why do we have so many um, um, uh, incoherent, often not quantitative outcome measures, and that's because we need to be more consistent in applying them. So again, there's an opportunity here to pick and choose the right ones for the sort of implementation questions that might arise, for example, in our context in Singapore, and then design pragmatic studies but however, where the measurement is quite robust, we don't need to rediscover the wheel. There's there's a whole library of those outcome measures uh, uh, now that we can use and build on, so we can reduce this level of of variation, which which I think will be helpful to everybody, because otherwise we end up in going around describing things in a very qualitative manner, and it's very hard to answer questions like our colleagues are asking, what makes a good implementation, or well, what's the percentage improvement in the implementation, in the uptake or acceptability or feasibility that you're finding, uh, which would um, uh, justify an investment in, in in a particular implementation package or resource. And I think that's uh, what we're looking here at, at, at a, a future uh, methodological sort of research avenue that that we need to uh, we need to follow. Um, another couple of of uh, uh, questions that that we have. Are there any, um, so people want, again, to go try and go a bit more granular. So uh, we put dementia um, and people with dementia, um, uh, Eden, at the title of the webinar in the review. But there is a question as to uh, whether uh, you could identify differences based on different types of dementia. So from Alzheimer's to vascular to Parkinson's related and, and so on. So this is one of the questions we got. Can we comment uh, on this at all, based on um, on the review? I think that's a very interesting question. Um, so in our inclusion criteria, we generalized it to just dementia cases. We didn't dig, uh, dig into the specific types of dementia, but I also think this points to an issue with diagnostic capacity for a lot of these research studies. And diagnostics of uh, specific types of dementia is still rather, I would say, rather weak overall in the world. So I think that it was. It would be difficult to to deline delineate that into that level. But understandable. Was, so, yeah, no, you are completely understandable. Yeah. So maybe a brief comment because uh, we're just about to uh, to hit the top of the hour. So we've got a few minutes to conclude. Uh, and I know we we're not answering all, all all the questions here because we're running out of time. But please do get in touch with with Eden for those of you. They, there's a few more interesting questions in in there, and I'm sure there'll be more the more people think about this and potentially read the paper. Reshma, uh, a view from the ground. How do we approach this when we think about different types of dementia? Uh, maybe one minute to comment on this, and then we'll conclude. Uh, yeah, I mean, briefly, you've just mentioned everything. Just a couple of things. I think we need greater advocacy. So I think there's a question about how do we get faith-based organization to take a little bit more responsibility amongst other things. The question is we we actually need advocacy. Um, we, 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 we need a playbook. So rather than different types of dementia, how do you manage different um, different needs. I think what we are here is psychoeducation on, you know, different stages. We need care coordination uh, for different stages. So um, rather than types of dementia is the needs uh, for somebody who has behavioral problem, you know, whom do I contact? Um, so it, it's it's really good to have some sort of uh, um, national playbook um, where and if we can have a seamless data transfer um, or contact points them I mean, in the community struggling. How do they contact say hospital providers to close the gap? So these are some of the things I'm sure we can work on, and there's a lot of work in progress at the moment. Um, and yes, we 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 do need to decide about what exact outcomes that we want to monitor, and we will need 
um, to consult the academia on this. So this is where the knowledge transfer, the academia, and everybody needs to come together on it. Thank you very much. Excellent. So, so on on that note, and and clearly with a lot of uh, clinical work to do and a lot of implementation uh, uh, work to do in Singapore and beyond, uh, I think it's time for me to uh, thank you, Eden. You're our, our key speaker uh, for the day. I think you did a wonderful job once again of presenting a very complex piece of work. Reshma, thank you uh, for sharing uh, your opinion uh, based on your own uh, and the wider uh, uh, research that you're involved in, and and of course your uh, experience on the ground. Uh, thank you to all of our attendees. I think uh, we hit about 150, which is uh, absolutely lovely for our first webinar of the year and a mark for us to uh, hit in this second event, uh, which we'll be advertising hopefully shortly. Thank you all very much. Have a wonderful afternoon uh, or evening and see you at the next busy webinar. Thank you.